can. Okay, well, I appreciate all of you coming today, and I just wanted to do a little bit of a project about, or a little bit of a program about what all the projects are, and I really got in over my head because I didn't realize how many wonderful projects we have, so my problem has been of trying to cut down enough to where I can fit it onto one hour thing and yeah. still and still kind of give an overview of what everybody's doing, so... That's impossible. I think it would take six sessions to cover what all is going on. So we have some really great faculty doing some great projects. But let me get started. So MTSU does believe in the value of experiential learning, merging classroom knowledge with the real world. So that's what this is about. Different kinds of EXL courses are all of these. Pretty much any course we can find a way to make it an EXL course, even if it's just service learning, and they learn to give to the community, and they learn organizational skills and good citizenship. And EXL benefits everybody. So the community's benefiting, the students are benefiting, and everybody actually enjoys that. And all of our research here at MTSU bears out the national research, which says that students do much better in experiential learning environments and they like it better. So they, um, our senior survey showed that they were better to, uh, able to analyze ideas, guide others, work independently, and being prepared for employment. And also EXL faculty members were ranked higher. And it's on good areas. I mean, giving assignments related to the goals of the course and enthusiastic about the subject. It motivates me to do my best work. I mean, those are good things that EXL faculty are ranked higher on. At this point, I wanted to have Edwin Robertson speak just a second from the student's perspective because he's our recent EXL scholar, graduate. Yay. Yes, and he's in graduate school here now. Yeah. And so, <laughs> give it a little bit from your perspective. All right, my name's Edwin. Um, I just wanted to talk to you all about uh, three classes whose projects really helped me out then and now. And actually, uh, the professors for those classes are sitting here today, so thank you. I first want to start off with my Intro to Organizational Communication class. In that class, for our EXL project, we were asked to do 10 hours of community service. And during that community service, really examine the organizational communication, culture, and leadership that was present there. So in that, I got to further my education while giving back to the community. Um, which is valuable to me, it's valuable to the school. Uh, so EXL for me, a lot of that is helping myself while helping others, at least in that case. Um, also, uh, another class that meant a lot to me was multinational organizations, which was taught by Dr. McCormick right here. Um, in that class, we learned about multinational organizations. Um, <laughs> a big focus of that class was also training which is what I ended up pursuing and what I'm in grad school for now. Um, that class gave me valuable training experience because Dr. McCormick asked us to choose a multinational corporation or organization, um, reach out to a local branch, get to know them, and then create a day-long training for soon-to-be expatriates, people who are going to start a new build in another country. So we chose Starbucks, went and met with them, got to know them, got their handbook, uh, learned a lot about them and their international stores, and through that experience, gained a lot of training knowledge as well as organizational knowledge. Finally, um, the one that has done me, or has helped me the most up until now, uh, is interview communication, because that gave me valuable experience with interviews. It wasn't just a class where we sat there and learned how to interview because that doesn't do any good because your first interview, you're going to be scared witless. Um, that was a W. Right. <laughs> um, so in that class, to give us the, or the experience, she asked us to actually choose an organization, research them, learn as much as we could about them so that when we went in, we would have questions to ask them, be able to have a good rapport built, and do that. So uh, I chose Ingram Book Company and met with a woman named Calandrian Davis. They didn't actually have a position available at that time, but she was still willing to meet with me, do the interview process, do multiple interviews, and then at the end give me really valuable feedback. So through that EXL project, I gained lots of interview experience, and now 
you know, how to conduct an interview, know how to prepare for an interview, how to follow up on one, how to stand up for myself during interviews. And so really for me, the EXL Scholar Program has just been invaluable to me. It's given me so much experience and knowledge to move forward with my education and eventually with my career. And I wanted to try to pull a few examples from the different colleges because we do have things all across all six colleges. So in the basic and applied sciences, we have several in agriculture, aerospace, even biology, chemistry, computer science, physical science, and even those that you think might be really hard, there's some examples. So in agriculture, one of the things they did was do planting beds at the veterans' home. Oh, yeah. And Another one that they did is when they went to Argentina and went through food processing, and they had to work in every kind of food processing plant, so like poultry and all the different things. <laughs> Another thing they did is build fences. I think that may have been in Honduras, I don't remember, but the agriculture bit built fences in one of the countries, so lots of stuff. Now, we've got another one that's a biology class. And Dr. Kim Sadler goes out, and she usually does six of these or something, and a crazy number in a semester. But they go out into the bar parks and battlefields and identify, the students identify all the species that are non-native. And then all of those species that they have found that are non-native, they pull them. Yeah, so that's a really nice ecological project. And then we have several lab courses even. One of the ones is Dr. Judith Gross, and she does energy audits. So the students have to do energy audits and determine the footprint for different kinds of activities and also the carbon footprint that they leave. And then she also has them to find the most cost-effective way to drive the Trail of Tears route so, <laughs> here in Murfreesboro. So uh, unique ways, so just some really unique applications. She also is in charge of the um, in Expanding Your Horizons Conference, and so we actually have a course. It's a one credit hour course that students, leadership course, that students that want to work at that conference can sign up for. Then they not only get the experience in working with the STEM, but they also get to you know, help with a conference, so they get that leadership. So that's another one. So keep that in mind if students are looking for a one hour thing for leadership. And then we have several also in behavioral and health sciences. So strength and conditioning, we have students who go out to high schools or work with teams here even at uh, Middle Tennessee. They all get paired up and work with actual athletes or with someone who needs that training. Um, family and consumer sciences and health and nutrition, all of those go out into the community and they do health pre like preventive training or they do um, blood pressure screenings in the schools, the health uh, body mass index screenings, and all those kind of things where they're actually going to do it in a public service, but it's something that they need to know, and they're, so they're learning by doing. Uh, nutrition, they actually do um, projects where they're talking, doing teaching things on health and nutrition, proper eating. Um, Nursing program has tons of different things. I think I have some examples here of some of the things that they go out and do. And then also we have psychology classes, and I have a couple of examples here. But um, here's one where aging health and development class goes out and works with senior citizens in the community. So they go out to nursing homes and things, and they're interacting to learn about aging, but they're also given that. So it's really great. And then here's where I was talking about a family wellness festival. So students putting on some kind of wellness fair. And the nursing projects, one of those, the very first thing they do is go out to a home of an elderly person and evaluate the home for safety conditions. They evaluate if the elderly person is eating correctly. Do they have trip hazards in their home? All of these things, are they capable of being independent? And so they do evaluations on them, and then they go back and do a couple follow-ups, and one of the follow-ups that they do then is the teaching. And I've read in some of their e-portfolios where they actually, if they see the person needs something, the student will take that back out to them. So it's really sweet how they, 
they take on a person that they kind of take care of. But that's one. Volunteer in the community working on health-related issues. We've talked about some of those where they may do a wellness fair or health fair, preventive teaching, and going out to the schools. Uh, one of the ones is where they make up a game for kids to teach them about health. I thought that was an interesting one. And then psychology, we've got several here. A lot of this is original research. So Tom does an original research class, and the students present at the Middle Tennessee uh, Psychological Association. Um, we have um, an apprenticeship program where they're working right now with CDC and the Tennessee Department of Ed on uh, healthy lifestyles with Tennessee schools. Each, their two students are presenting at a symposium today on those things. So, you know, there's lots of ways that you can do an EXL class. And then here just a couple examples. The American Democracy Project. We had students who went, I think we had five students this summer who went and presented at a national conference on their original research. Mm -hmm. And College of Business, of course, we have lots of different things to do with management, leadership, marketing, uh, personal selling. We have, um, I think I have some examples. They did a bike rodeo and wellness fair. So they plan the event. So part of their whole educational process is they're having to do the budget, plan the event, do the timelines, all of the things that go with that. But then in the end, they're doing a service to the community. Same thing with Culture Fest 2012. The two classes paired up and actually put that on last year. So that was a big event and went over really well. Uh, Dancing with the National Stars is another event. The food drive and the clothing closet drive. So those are just some of the examples that they've done. Um, Jean Wilson does a lot of different projects, and she did a, two or three different things with the We Care Daycare. So they did a silent auction, raise money for them. The students actually built things for them, like bookcases or things that they needed. And so they did that kind of project. And then they also raised uh, a lot of money and had a match. So another company matched them, and so they were able to give a lot of money. Um, they, they do, um, I think, Journey Home and some of the different organizations here that they give that to. College of Liberal Arts, we have some really neat things here, and this is where I have my majority of the faculty. <laughs> I wondered when I got the uh, response back from most of the liberal arts, and especially communication, well, that makes sense, right? <laughs> You're ready to communicate. <laughs> so um, one that I thought was really interesting, though, is anthropology. Now, who would have ever thought? They do a pro bono service for the Tennessee Division of Archaeology. And they actually went through 25 sets of human remains this last semester. <laughs> yeah. They like it. Yeah. But isn't that a great hands-on project if you were studying? <laughs> okay, and then we're ready for Patrick. Okay. So he's going to talk about his argumentation and debate. Yeah, I teach uh, COM 3210, which is argumentation. Officially right now is what it's called, but it's going to be a uh, change to argumentation debate because it better reflects it. And so I basically break the class down into three components. Uh, the first half of the class is just lecture, teaching them what debate is, what argumentation is, how to put an argument together how to defend it, fallacies, etc. The second half of the class we spend actually debating in class, and so that's kind of, they debate each other, and there's a little fun, but it's not the real world. And so the third component is the EXL component, where I actually bring in uh, the community aspect, and I give them a choice. They can either go to a, a college debate tournament and debate other college students who do this every weekend, or they can observe two uh, community debates, whether they're for city council, if it's an election year election, whatever it is, and then they write about 10 or 12 page reflection paper. So most end up going with the debate because they only have to write about five page reflection paper. <laughs> and it's interesting because what happens is you teach them all these skills and theories and they're like, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. And then you take them to a debate tournament and put them against competitive debaters. People who aren't their friends, who aren't going to take what they say for reality, and they're basically going to tell them they're liars to their face. <laughs> and the growth between the first round and the last round is incredible, because they usually do about six rounds. In the first round, they're just all terrified. 
and most of them just get destroyed. But <laughs> as they go round by round, they learn very quickly. And so I think from an EXL community standpoint, there is no way to teach them these skills in the class. I mean, you can say it over and over and over, but until they're in the dogfight, until they actually see it happen and they're part of the process, they don't understand it. And what I think is interesting is we do the class debates typically after the debate tournament, and they debate very well in the class. They're more aggressive. They're more, uh, they have a lot more self-esteem. Uh, before, they would question themselves, but they learn real quick that it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. And so I've had students come back to me from taking this class and tell me, this class is one of the most important ones that I've taken because I'm willing to stand up to my boss. I'm willing to make an argument for what I think is right or for what I'm asked to do, and I'm not as nervous about it. And so I think it teaches them a real-world skill. And beyond just the skills, what I've learned, too, is I actually have the ability to track them. And last year, we took about nine students to the debate tournament, four of which broke into what are called the out rounds, which is really good because they beat competitive debaters and continued forward. Uh, this year, we held it on our campus, a tournament. And so I entered them as a mock team uh, under MTSU's name, but we didn't have any actual MTSU debaters in the team whatsoever. It was all class people. And so the MTSU debate team helped them prep, but they were not debating with them. And uh, it's tradition at a debate tournament, you don't take your own sweepstakes because it's kind of seen as unfair, like you're hosting a tournament and you're winning your own trophies. Uh, but unofficially, the team from our team, the EXL class, took first place. Uh, they didn't win the tournament outright, but they won enough as individuals throughout the tournament to be the best team there. And so you're taking people who have no idea what argumentation is, no idea what debate is other than, you know, two presidential candidates arguing against each other, putting them in a real-world situation and letting them go, and they rise to the challenge. And I think that's a really unique opportunity for the students to be able to do that and learn those skills. And so they can't not only say, well, I learned the theory, but I put it into use, and here's how it actually works. So I think it's a good project. Uh, I'm going to continue with it as we go. And like I said, so far, most of the students take the debate option, which I think is interesting. Even though, from an academic standpoint, I would think the paper option is easier. <laughs> but they don't. They'll, they'll jump into the, the harder one. So that's basically what I do in a nutshell. And so far, so good. Yeah. And I can vouch for Patrick because I had a student who wrote about that in their EXL portfolio, and they talked about how terrified they were the first time, <laughs> and how by the time they got to the end, now they're confident. So, isn't that awesome? All right, and so I'm just going to, I know I have some ORCOs here, so I'm not going to do much in that, except I want to just kind of give you an idea of organizing events and fundraising projects, uh, looking at topics of gender, and that's by going out and actually interviewing and talking to people. Uh, doing SWOT analysis. Somebody mentioned the pre-departure training program, I think, earlier, and a communication audit where students, I actually had a student who came back who's been on her job a year or two now, but last year she came back and she said, I got my job because of that communication audit. So they went out, did an audit on the company, and, came, and got the job. And then um, planning a project for an organization and assisting with it. So. Here's a few of the, for those of you that aren't here, I mean, for the ones that weren't here, I want to kind of throw out a few more ideas. They, uh, we had a benefit concert, a volleyball tournament, a fashion show, and a dog show. That was a, <laughs> a new one. This weekend, they're having a battle of the DJs in one of the classes, and that's going to be a fundraiser. Um, Lori Kissinger's ORCO classes, and she does lots of different projects and works with the um, disabled uh, youth a lot. And so her project was including high school. It included college students. They worked with the uh, Raiders Learning Community. They worked with a math class. So they connected a speech class and a math class together. And they did this project. And then they went down to the Parthenon and did a presentation to and the presentation was recorded, and it's going to be sent across to Greece, and all, you know, just really amazing things, how she tied all those things together. And there's some examples of the students. One disabled student that's helping the other. 
And again, this is still part of that same project, and there they are at the Parthenon where they helped. The speech students provided narration and did that organiza organization and planning. And then this one I just thought was so cute from the pictures, but <laughs> I just have to use it. <laughs> they actually raised $7,000 from this legal speakeasy that they did. And so they had the, one of the guys is from the Predators. I think the guy in the middle may be like one of the owners or something of the Predators. But they had some big people there that gave apparently plenty of money. And then we have the theater students drama across the curriculum and at Yeti. They perform, actually do performances out in the schools. And this was the first one is called Appalachia. And so they performed that out in rural schools. This one was one they did in Honduras. Mm -hmm. And they performed at an orphanage and helped with those children. And then we're ready for Terry McCoy. While she stands up, I want to say one thing for Lori real quick. She did her orca class. She did uh, work with veterans on a meeting. It was at Rowley Joe's down on the square uh, last week, and it was standing room only. Oh, wow. That place was packed. Probably well beyond the fire market. Rowley Joe's is where a lot of this coffee yeah. shop on the square, the marina. Oh, here, just one. Oh, yeah. Do that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Lori our, our colleague, is also the director of the nonprofit PSA. So she incorporates you know, that nonprofit with all of those classes. Every class she did some major project like that. The results are incredible. But she's drawn from two very strong you know, components that are your colleagues. Yeah. Um, so the class I want to tell you about, beyond the one Edwin mentioned that they did together, the one um, I'm having a struggle with how to say right now is consulting and auditing. That is our capstone class. I thought the one comment you just heard that doing communication audits within an organization is a great next step into career. For our seniors in Fort Go, we have them choose an organization, any organization, choose a mentor within the organization so that they've got that first hand line for the entire semester. And from there, they go in and they break down and do a communication audit of all the systems that are in place, how they're working, how they're not working, pure data collection, but it takes half the semester. It's very detailed, <laughs> and it's data and data and data collection. At that point, they can sit back and compare and contrast with their peers who also did data collection. And this is an important step. They see that one company's weaknesses is the other one's strength, and so on. And a lot of one of this is taught online right now. I'm the only one who teaches it, so I get to see this growth through the semester. And they compare and contrast. You know what's going on. So when I say, all right, second half of the semester, now you're the consultant and you're going to create a proposal and it has to be of the quality to give to the organization and say, as if you had hired me, here's what I'm willing to do for you in terms of results. They have to set their own fee. They have to go on salary.com and all that. What do consultants really charge? They have to come up with feasible timelines. They have to do it as is. Right? And then they do. They create wonderful proposals. They create their own logos and all of this for who they are. The fun part is they get to create their own history. And they'll say, I've been consulting in Nashville for the last 10 years. <laughs> 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 for how good I am. But it really builds that confidence, like Edwin was talking about, that then they can go ahead and take something with confidence to the organization. And uh, I, the feedback I get to see is things were truly implemented even though it was a student's assignment via the mentor, they say, do you want me to try this? Can we can we use this? And we're always, yes, yes, you can. Yes, you can. The students get the credit. So it uh, works very well every semester. And they say it's the best paper that they write because it's 25, 30 pages of factual information that they did all on their own. All on their own. So it's the confidence book that they can pass to their peers. Yeah, Edward's got it. You remember. So <laughs> you did very well at it. Yeah, very well. Thank you. <laughs> Projects going on. Okay, and we're ready for Mary Beth. I went ahead and kind of put these since they all go together. Yep. Just okay, together. okay, so um, aside from what Edwin <laughs> talked about, too, uh, one of the classes that I just recently developed was a health campaign class for organizational communication. And so um, it was, well, how do we make this EXL, you know, like, we can't necessarily say, hey, Cancer Society, we're going to make you a campaign, like type of thing. So um, what I decided to do was kind of two parts. So first of all, um, 
The class is always taught in the spring, which is always when MTSU has Relay for Life. And so the first component of their EXL is that they have to work with Relay for Life in some way so that they can have experience actually working on putting on an event for the community, putting on something, and, you know, so that's a resume builder right there. But then um, the second component is that we do put on, like, a health fair for the university. So um, the class is divided up into groups, and there are probably about five groups, and the groups um, take a health issue that college students deal with because that's their population. And so they research the issue. They, they, we um, actually do actual research on college students, so we incorporate that into the class where they send out a survey and they get their responses on how stressed are they, you know, do they eat well, do they, um, are they sleeping enough, you know, those types of things. And they use that to come up with, yeah, they use that to come up with their campaign. And so it helps them to research a specific topic and then they create the big board and um, and um, we apply for the EXL grant and we get it because um, each team has a budget because as, as you've ever, if you've ever been to a health fair, they always give you something, right, to remember the cause. So it also teaches them to work within a budget, you know. So they'll, um, we'll order something with their little slogan on it. So like, for example, last year's, um, one of the slogans was, don't be a mess, deal with stress, right? <laughs> and so... You know, they wanted to hand out little stress balls for people. And so um, it helped help them figure out, wow, you know, I can't buy really the thing I want because we have this constraint in terms of budget. So they were like, well, we want to give, you know, these giant stress balls. And they're like, oh, those cost a dollar fifty a piece. We can only order, like, ten of them. <laughs> so, you know, so it was um, – it helped them to learn, like, here's what actually goes into a campaign. You have to work with budgets. You have to work with your audience. You have to analyze your audience. And, you know, and then when people would come by, you know, they would hand them the stuff. They would tell them why this is important to them, you know, and why you should be sleeping, why you should be dealing with stress and all of those things. And so they got a lot out of it because they were like, I didn't know it would be so hard. Like, so much was involved. And it isn't just coming up with a slogan. It's, you know, making a slogan specific to the people, creating, you know, a catching uh, poster, creating um, a way, a, an attention getter to get people in and get people interested. So um, they seem to really enjoy it. And so at the end of the class, they kind of have two things that they can kind of add to their resume. So, you know, we planned an event, we planned the health fair, but also we helped with an actual event on campus. So we just have and I had worked with some of the students coming in and out of my office who worked on the relay thing, so I knew no. <laughs> work on that. Okay, and then Deborah. Deborah does art. And your slides are coming after that. So you can just push them. Okay. What's well, exciting hearing what everyone's doing in here? I developed a Scandinavian study abroad program, EXL, and one of the reasons I like this program is because it makes me think about things that are possible in our own country and how we can support education and support our children. So, for example, one of the schools that we go to, I want you to imagine this, 31 children, first through seventh grade, they have eight teachers in their school. Okay. Also, another thing that's interesting is they're really interested in having children with their bodies. They're not as afraid of walking as we are. So you'll see some visuals soon where, as part of their curriculum, kids are climbing up and down the mountain. <laughs> and, and it's normal. And in doing wonderful things. Um, what I like to say about Scandinavia Broad EXL is it's life-changing. And I have that concept of opening your imagination to possibilities as they're gaining job skills. And that's a biggie for me, is I want my students to leave the experience and especially leave our program having skills they haven't before. So one thing in art education we look for is that our students can teach on different cultures. So one way to understand and appreciate a culture is to go and visit that. And so that not only includes art museums, which we actually teach in, but also the interior landscape and the folklore you know, about waterfalls and fish and stories that go along with it. And then to make our experience rich, we work with the children and teachers firsthand 
in schools. Um, I think this picture summarizes the experience for us. You gotta imagine we're going into a school for a week. They don't know us very well, and by the time that we leave, there's just a sense of closeness to the children and the teachers. And students and teachers end up crying, and the kids <laughs> meet us at the train station saying goodbye and, and come back to us. And this year's theme was really special. We used the Norwegian fairy tale, East of the Sun and West of the Moon, and it's a story of a poor young lady who leaves her home, goes off like a polar bear. She was actually a secret little prince. <laughs> and the hardship that she finds out when she's been placed into the spell of a troll. And so we use that story to talk about obstacles and hardships in the children's lives. And then we interpreted them through class conversations. We used the teachers as translators for that teaching my students the skills of working with English language learners working with language arts because they're using folk tale and culture. And then we had the kids tell us their hardship. Uh, this picture is with the first and third graders, and we had wonderful stories of one little girl, there's a lot of water there, she was afraid of falling out of the boat. And so she made a picture of that. It was a real fear that she had. Other children had lost their pet, or some would say they were engaged in sports, they're very athletic and broke a bone. And, went to the hospital and then got back up and went out there again. And that was in Norway. I don't think I have a picture. I'll go back to this one. Uh, one of the one stories that was most touching to me was when we were in Denmark. And we worked with a fifth grade boy. And he was a twin. And when he was born, they didn't know if he was a boy or a girl because his whole central area just had problems. He had a cleft palate, just so many hardships. And he had many, many operations as a little boy. And so when we use this idea of obstacles, he was so honest with us that he was still working on his speech because he, he didn't speak as clearly. And he's speaking to us in English the best he can. And I'm like, wow, you're brave, OK? Because he wanted to communicate with us. And then for his story, what he did is he made a picture of the operating room. And the doctor had a very large <laughs> gavel. But what we did is we made it fun. We had an IKEA catalog and we cut it up. And so we had the hippest hospital sheets and pajamas <laughs> that you can ever find through art. And it, it really was therapeutic for him and that he was so honest in communicating about that with us. And so um, in, in doing that, in addition to working with the schools and, and having that experience with the kids, we also play turfs a bit as part of our program because we work in the smaller towns where people welcome us into their homes. We live with the future families, but then the big cities have the museums. And so for part of the experience, art teachers are expected to teach students how to work with original works of art. And so when we were in class, different students, they would work in pairs, and they have an hour, and they had to find an artwork in the gallery that they responded to favorably. And then they had to bring in aesthetic and criticism questions and sketching. And they had to do an on-site teaching project that they could relate to K through 12 teaching. And you could just see some of the sites that we taught in. These are saved churches in Norway. These are actually two different ones. And then what was really special, which helps uh, with ESL support, is at the end of our trip, we got to exhibit the children's book arts projects in the Todd Art Gallery. And this was the first time that art education ever had a gallery show. So that was a big deal for our students. And then we had people come out and lend us Norwegian artifacts. My students made instructional videos. So they, they figured out how to make these as part of their class and they got exhibition experience and also as art teachers, a lot of times, especially as they go into middle school and high school, they're expected to have full art exhibitions of their students' work. So that's it in a nutshell. And I'll show you some pictures you can have later. Sorry. Yeah, that's, that's Sorry. Our good lady. <laughs> And I can say you didn't have really good re response to the art show because I sent a student over for recon since I was there. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they said it was really good. And you know, the study job is expensive. Everything I do teach them is grant writing and scholarship skills so that they can afford to do. Uh, last year I took eight, and this year it looks like I might have 11 or 12. <laughs> right. and, and there's more who want to go. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
If you click on the print revival, it should bring up your PDF. Oh, okay. Like that. It's cute. <laughs> yeah. That's a possum. Thank you. That's, that's, her other, that's her other part of her print. I'll talk about the possum okay. in a second. Um, so I teach printmaking here, and um, I've in art classes, one of the big things that I think is important, and one of the reasons I got involved in the EXL was, um, can I just hit camera? Yeah, yeah. Was um, bringing in visiting artists. It's kind of like bringing in a lecture, but it's more hands-on. Um, so if you don't know what printmaking is, it's basically like a stamping process, like screen printing or woodcuts. You make multiples. Um, so printmaking is a pretty gregarious community, um, so it, it affords me the opportunity to bring in different visiting artists. Well, last year um, I started working with the local colleges, Vanderbilt, Watkins, Belmont, and uh, Bowling Green University is one college that's gotten involved, uh, Murray State, MTSU of course, and then TSU and Austin P. So I worked with these other, oh, and as well as the University School of Nashville. So we're going to try to get the high schools more involved this year. So anyway, in conjunction with these local artists, we decided to do a Nashville print revival. Uh, Printmaking is pretty prevalent in the Nashville area, if you guys know about Hat Show Print. Um, so a lot of the students don't have any idea of the richness that exists here in the history and in contemporary printmaking. So our idea was that you know if we can pool our resources, we can create an event that the students can really respond to. Um, to give them sort of an, a better idea of a hands-on experience of their environment, how they could apply it in the future. So basically we brought in different visiting artists. Um, Vanderbilt brought in a couple of visiting artists, and this is all during the same week. Um, it's usually the second or third week of February. Um, Belmont organized an artist exhibition. So we had like a reception there one night during the week, and then we brought in two visiting artists at MTSU. MTSU actually has the nicest printmaking facilities in this region. It's nicer than Vanderbilt. It's a, it is the top-notch facilities. Um, and I've been to a lot of printmaking facilities, so having all that space really affords us the opportunity to do that. And what the students gain is they get to work with the artists, okay? They assist them in printing. You know, uh, right now I'm the only printmaking professor, so it's a pretty process-oriented uh, technique within the art fields. There are technical things, there's chemicals involved. So when you have one artist showing you how to do something, it's very different than another, how another artist can do something. So we brought in these different artists, and like this one is Brandon Sanderson. He showed them a photo process in lithography, which I've never done photo lithography before. So it's cool for me because I'm learning new processes that I can then share with my students in the following years. So basically they get to assist the artist, um, and we pull what's called an addition. So we have multiples, and so most of them get copies of the print for working with the artist. So in the class, usually they're required to log a certain amount of hours. I say six hours, uh, A, five hours, B, four hours, C, on this project. And then if they do extra, you know, extra credit, um, after the artist leaves, then they make a piece in response to their visit. So again, they're learning techniques. The artist does uh, critiques with them. We do a schedule so they can sign up to get the artist to review their work, which, you know, there, is, there are some rules to art, but everyone has different opinions. So it's good to get as many different opinions as you can on your artwork. Um, the artists that I'm bringing in this year are a collaborative team. So this year we're going to be talking about collaboration. Um, they're going to be combining lithography and woodcut with textiles. So we're going to try to get the textiles program involved. Um, they're going to talk about the use of upcycled materials because they use a lot of upcycled materials. So we're hoping to reach a wider audience with that. But they'll be working in the studio for a week with the students. Um, and this is just some images of their work. Um, and I show them the work before they come too, which I think the students get excited about as well. Um, the other artist that we're bringing in this year, Heather Freeman, is a printmaker, graphic designer, illustrator, animator. She's kind of got her hands in a lot of different cookie jars. So what we're going to try to do this year is actually offer a one-hour course, hopefully, this is pending approval, um, to where the students can sign up for a one-hour workshop. Um, when she gets here, she's going to teach them how to use a 3D modeling program. And so we can make an image in there and then flatten it out and print it and then reassemble them into uh, paper sculptures. And these are just some examples of the process. 
um, you know, not necessarily we're making people. Uh, we've developed a theme since since it's the Nashville Print Revival. The theme of the project is going to be revival, and so what. What we're hoping to do, too, is get the Honors College involved. Maybe the students in the Honors College can do some writing, and then our students can respond to that with images. So we'll have a limited number that can sign up for that workshop, but I'm still going to have all of my students and all of my classes do a theme of revival for their piece and do something that's like a template to be assembled. Um, and then hopefully we can show it. I've got one of my students trying to find a local space that we can have an exhibition of the work after it's done. Um, the other element of the print revival is that we do this thing, it's a poster fair in Nashville. Posters are really popular, so we had a local event at the Barista Parlor, and the students went to that, and they were just kind of blown away. You know, it's, it's, you twist their arms a lot of times to get them to get outside of their comfort zone. You know, hey, go to the Frist. And, okay, I'm not going to the Frist. You know, <laughs> it's so far. <laughs> Professor O'Connor, it's so far. I don't know. So, <laughs> So it's just hard. you got to twist arms. Oh, i got so much work to do. I don't want to go do this or that. So when you're like, it's a poster fair, they're like, oh, yeah, cool. It sounds like fun. So they get to go and see all this work and buy work and show their work, too, doing like an open portfolio. So um, it wasn't just locals. I mean, we had people come in from colleges in Alabama, from Kentucky. Um, I think we got people coming from South Carolina this year, too. So... I'm really excited about the second installment of it. We have, can I close this? There? Um, is that okay? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, there we go. We, um, we got, I got a grant to get a shuttle service. So we're going to have a shuttle going back and forth and for Hat Show Print to do some posters. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, this is our possum that we made this semester. I try to bring in a visiting artist every semester. And so we made a tribute to George Jones, whose nickname was Possum. Um, but we're taking it on Broadway um, a week from Friday. They're doing a tribute concert. So it's not required for class or anything. It's just something we're doing. I want to show you guys about. <laughs> How many seats will you have for audit on your hand? <laughs> as many, yeah. Come on. Okay, and then we move on to history. We have some really neat projects in history as well, and that's not one you would normally think about having good hands-on, but they, uh, one, one instructor had them do the eight to ten minute history documentary on a family history or local history, or even they can do MPSU history if they want to. And so the students really enjoy that. And then Mary Evans has a civic engagement and a historian's craft where they go out and do oral interviews. And so this last time they worked on civil rights issues and interviewed people about during that time when the civil rights issues were really big. Um, so it's lots, lots of neat things that you could even do with the history and other courses that you might not think would necessarily lend themselves so much to the hands-on. Also political science. We have a lot of courses in political science. They do a lot of projects, but they also do research. Um, they did Moot Court, Model UN the intercollegiate state legislature, so lots of things that they do in the political science program. And the College of Education as well, they do lots of things out in the community, teaching events, tutoring, all kinds of things that they do out with the community. Um, the teacher education in early childhood actually works hands-on with students, so they may be assigned a student who needs extra help and they go out into the schools and try to help bring the student up to par or just work and even um, things like Project Help where the students go and actually serve several hours throughout the semester. And Terry Tharp does uh, family literacy nights with her reading students and so they actually, they uh, will actually go tutor but they also have these family literacy nights where they bring in, that's a partnership with the Reach and Succeed and bring in the parents of the children and they have a little spaghetti supper and then go up, read books and get, try to get the parents encouraged to start reading with the children. So it's a really great program. They do a lot of that. And the College of Mass Communication, <laughs> we have um, Dr. Farrell this last semester actually won uh, an award. That they, her students won the national competition for an ad for natural gas. So I, have, I think I have a slide in here. 
but and Claire Bratton does wonderful projects in the community with the nonprofits. These students um, do websites for the nonprofits. They do commercials. They write all, all kinds of things. They do hours and hours and hours of work for free to help the nonprofits do their publicity. And um, Dr. Allegood did one this summer that was a really neat concept on journalism. He actually took the students and they went to each region of the state of Tennessee, dropped them down like they were a reporter on the spot. And so they had to go and interview local people and make their story and then it printed in the local paper. Yeah, and so the students really enjoyed it and we have an article where the, one of the newspapers said they really appreciated the students coming out and helping them. and some really nice work as a result of that. So that was a unique take on doing that. And then uh, Rick Carnes in recording industry, he pairs students up with a mentor in Nashville, and they actually have to write an original song. They have to uh, get all the music and everything with it, and then they have to go pitch it to someone in the industry. That person in the industry then gives them feedback. They have to go back and do reworks on it and then go back and look at it again. And so some really nice hands-on work with the music industry with using his connections. So he's able to get them in to the door like that. Um, this is the one on the uh, natural gas campaign. So this is where they won the, natural, the national campaign. This one is on Claire Bratton, and this is just talking about how much work the students did. They did this one for the foreign language nonprofit, but they did several nonprofits and lots and lots of hours of time that they spent. And we, I talked a little bit already about the recording industry, where they meet, meet the music publishers, they pitch the songs. They also work a lot of events. I had one student that just came in this week who had worked the CMAs all last week. So yeah, some really they do some really fun things too. But um, and then they have to have two to three recordings for release on a campus record label. So I thought that was really interesting. And then just an example of how they collaborate. So you have a singer songwriter who's working with an audio engineer to, to do their recording. Also in the Honors College, we have one class where they produce an issue of collage. And so that's the class, that is their job, is to produce that issue. And then this is an interesting, just in case you don't think about something like Habitat for Humanity having so many different uses. Um, I've had a business student who did Habitat for Humanity, and they looked at it, and they volunteered and did the service, but they also looked at it from the business model perspective. So how do they get their funding? Uh, how does the management work? How, does the, how do they get the information out to the job site? How does, how does the supervisor on the job site work with the people that are out there working? So all of that. Um, also, communication students that went Habitat for Humanity, and they did their communications plan. So they looked at the flow of communication and upward and down and all of the different ways that they um, do those communication audits. And then an engineering student who was working out there and some of their parts didn't fit. And the engineering student was able to make, make the part fit. So, you know, it's, you don't think about all of these ways that you could use a Habitat for Humanity project to actually be a service learning project. But if you send them out with, you know, that they need to be watching for these opportunities, then this from business to you know, communications to engineering, and I'm sure there's plenty of other places that you could think where you could plug in. But you just usually don't think about those having those kind of opportunities. And service learning, of course, is giving back to the community, and they learn more about themselves. One other we haven't talked much about yet because it's so naturally hands-on is the internships and co-ops, but we do have lots of those going on. A lot of them are already EXL, but there's a lot that aren't. And really the only thing they have to add to be EXL is a reflection, which they're probably doing anyway because most of the ones I've talked to already do a reflection. And then somebody fill out the rubrics once a year and send a report once a semester on the activities that they're doing. So it really, if you know of any internships or co-ops that aren't EXL, it's really pretty easy to turn those in. Same thing with the study abroad 
you know, those are naturally EXL or experiential. You just need to do that one little extra step. Okay, and so that pretty much takes me through what I had prepared. It's almost time, but there's two or three things that um, I forgot to mention. So like in business, for example, we had a um, class that did a project for LP products. And they actually did a business plan on how to take this business international. And they said that they had had another consulting company do one of those plans for them. And the consulting company charged $60,000 for their plan. They said the MPSU student plan was better, and they got it free, and they used it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so all of those students, when I see their portfolios now, they're saying they helped develop this plan that is being implemented. So, you know, it's a really great resume building, all those things that they're um, trying to think any of the others. But there's, there, there's so many good projects but I was trying to make it fit within the time that we had. And so I'm sure I've left off lots and lots of ones that I would like to mention. Can uh, any of you have any others? I have a general question on this play. So I'm just I'm looking at these. This could apply. I'm at social work and we're doing some group projects to work on local agencies and creating them, you know, using their data and running reports for them and stuff. And the challenge for me is I don't know what this group is. And I just deal with that. Like your proposals, some of your individual proposals, but still a lot of this stuff seems really squishy and it's hard to have a time to look at. So, I don't know if y'all have any rubrics. I mean, yeah, yeah. 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 I don't I think it's going to show them the rubrics too before yeah. Yeah. I understand. As a student, I appreciate it seeing the groups. Yeah. 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 Yes, that's what I think. You said they're group projects. Do you have them grade each other? Um, you ever had them like reflect um, on each other? I mean, that's one thing I've done with group projects in the past, and that usually settles them down a little bit. And they're they're they keep each other in check, yeah. And and if there's like one person that's black, and you have four other people saying this person's black, yeah, yeah. So so if they all look on the side, just have them read each other's work. Well, yeah. You design I mean, it. Yeah. You design it, and then you can have like if you're doing a big group project or multiple projects together, you can have individual project rubrics. Yeah. Or sometimes if it's a whole, you can just put a whole list of employee rubrics and group the whole component together and then you base it on that. And you can also yeah. look at the EXL rubrics if those help because yeah. we have experience-based okay. knowledge rubric. We have a, a reflective thinking rubric, a, you know, um, organizational skills and leadership and all that. So, Thank yeah, we you. can share those. And also, don't forget about the, if you're looking for places to work with, the database that we have now. We're still updating that all the time. And that, that database is all of the nonprofits in our area with the job descriptions that they, or volunteer positions that they have, time frames when they need people. It's online. It's online. Uh -huh. it's on the I may have to send it, I'll get the list and send that link out to you all because right now you have to, there's a link and a password I'll need to give you. Yeah. <laughs> we have um, a collaborative learning book and several other resources in here that might help with your group work thinking. Uh, it's a couple of things that I've shared with others recently. Sometimes they, uh, faculty have expressed difficulty in getting the groups going, you know, get them started. And a couple of things that have helped. One is to uh, have them to sign a contract. Here's what's expected of you in the group. And, and yeah. if you don't fulfill yeah. that, you're letting the group down, not just me as an instructor. And, and another is, a, is an evaluation form that it will help the peer-to-peer -peer evaluation. So if you want to look at some of those resources, we've got a lot in here on collaborative learning. Say in here, so here more yes, more. here in the actual yeah. books. Okay. Yeah. And, <laughs> they still exist, yeah. Students usually like Marker Film downstairs. Do y'all have a scanner up here? <laughs> yeah. But you can scan it in, I guess. Yeah. Okay.
Okay, well, I think our time is about up, but if, you, if you're if welcome to stay or get anything else you'd like to have, and I really appreciate all of you sharing, and it's so exciting to me to hear. I mean, I kind of know what's going on, but to hear all of those outcomes is really great. I get it. Thank you. And if you're thinking about an Excel course, come tomorrow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 12 30. I'm not going to be in my house. Well, I can work with you. And so, yeah, I know. I thought we're doing this. Okay.